folks, I'd like to invite producer Jeremy Thomas to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here you are. Evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out for this. A very select group. You're a very select group. <laughs> We're so lucky to have you. Um, this is incredible to have you here in person. And just to get us started, how did this film come about? It's clear that Mark has an admiration for you. Have you had a relationship with him? Where did this start? Well, you know, he, <clears throat> he's, um, it's a small country, the cinema. And um, Mark Cousins, um, much younger than me, but he was the director of the Edinburgh Film Festival and he, he liked my films that I produced a lot, and in particular, he liked bad timing, as you can see. And when he was a kid, he raved about that film on television. I suppose he he was of a similar mind, and he probably was enthusiastic about some of the films I made over the years. And I followed his films because he's a m magnificent documentarian, filmmaker, film historian, genuinely wonderful person, as you can see, with a very mellifluous voice, which is very attractive. And he's a very nice guy to hang out with a lot, you know, because you can talk about your favorite subject, which is movies, you know. Mm. And um, to us, it's not a business, it's a, it's a game, you know. It's a, it's a pleasure, it's a passion, it's a lifestyle. And uh, when he said to me, um, I'd like to make a film about your journey to Cannes, because it's well known within the film business that I drive to Cannes every year for 45 years, stopping on the way down at various places that interest me or happen to stop or break down, whatever happens. And um, he said, I'd like to film it. And I said, can you do it by yourself? And yes, I film like, make, like to make my films. He had two cameras with him and he charged every night and a recorder. And uh, that's what you saw on the film. You know, he just drove with me and he followed me around at Cannes for a few, for a few days with a new film by Mike. And um, you saw a bit of, you saw a bit of what it was like, um, a taste, I suppose, and I let him in to see that mm -hmm. in private. It was quite private. I was, he got more out of me than I thought. Mm. I thought I'd be, you know, much more hidden, and uh, but I have no idea really. You can't have an idea about. Um, yeah, he liked me, <laughs> and he um, is a fan of my films. And we have similar, um, we have shared knowledge. And it's always nice being with people who have sure shared knowledge and you can just wrap along for hours with them and, uh, and talk about things. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful talking with people who um, you can really get deeply into a subject. And I could do that with Mark on and off the camera and uh, had a very wonderful journey down to south of France. <laughs> I mean, five days in a car with one person is also not easy, so it's clear well, that um, there was... <laughs> yeah, well, we had the music, and we had yeah. the, 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 the stopping, and uh, we had the screen. And uh, I say it in the film, but it's, I just drove from Toronto. I had a film in Toronto, and I rented a car in Toronto, one-way rental. I was lucky to get a very nice car that was registered in Florida. Mm -hmm. They gave us an upgrade to a supercar because we had to get it back to America, and we drove with um, Ludovico, in fact, was driving, who's here. She was driving in another car somewhere else off camera who joined on the journey. And then when we stopped at night, she was there mm -hmm. with, with us. And we had a nice drive down. And I like being in the car because you're closer to it. You know, when you're in a plane, you're far away from it. And a train, you're going over mm -hmm. it fast. It's better to walk or get a bicycle, but in a car you can stop and you can smell it a bit. And it's a nice way to get around. And we're all so rushed and, yeah. and I'm in charge of my time. And I hate the queuing and I hate the travel in the airports now. It's really a punishment that we have to go through. And in the car, you have a nice boat journey and then you're free as a bird and you leave when you want, no checkout time, no packing. No worries. And, um, you know, as I said, as long as you don't have a blowout, you're in a good shape. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious how much creative input did you have into this film? Zero. And zero. Zero. Okay. Nothing. I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing. I was the subject of the film. 
Mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with input. I saw the film and that was it. I didn't ask for any cuts. I didn't. Wow. I had no vanity. So I looked old and, and stooped and, <laughs> and limping and whatever. But uh, inside is this young person. <laughs> right. After seeing the film, so Mark breaks it down into these sections, right? After seeing the film, what is one theme that you would like to have seen or add? What, what is one theme you would have added maybe to those five categories? No, I'm, no, I, no I think he pretty well got, got, got the categories. And, um, yeah, we talked about sex and death and all the things that we mm -hmm. need to talk about. And uh, I'm happy to make them in my films mm -hmm. and show them and um, still want to do that in a very restricted way now. But I had the privilege mm. from sort of mid-70s till 2005 sort of thing to do what I wanted. And um, those are, that's what happened for me. Yeah. You know, we just, it was, and it was, um, it was, um, it was nice being with Mark Cousins because we could uh, talk about taste, which is all in our biz, our trade, which is really um, it's something which is um, an amazing thing. But it's, um, to be privileged to use your taste to choose what you work on, that what um, that's what I strove for, and I want to manage to do, principally for most of my 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 producing um, of films, mm -hmm. and um, I, that was um, silly to use the word lucky. But I was lucky to exist in a period, and was my prolific period was in a period of maximum freedom, mm. and um, there was very little editorial control over us, mm. and a singular person made a film, and very few singular people can make films anymore. Was Anderson, Scorsese, who have the strength to take keep people away from what they're doing and give us an individual vision, mm. but all the films, probably the people who are in here, love. They're all made by people with an individual vision mm. and not messed around with multiple choice. And um, that's what I still try and achieve for my, with the filmmakers I work with. So are you describing that as kind of an era? And how do you see Hollywood shifting? And do you think with all of these changes, is there a space for art house? Producing? There's always a space for the independent in any trade, whatever it is. You know, there's an independent and there's a group of people who don't like um, who are happy to uh, to be individualistic and uh, remain in some sort of counterculture to the normal, who even seek it out, and I think they'll remain. And I, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic about the cinema. It was an era. Um, it was an era that's finished, pretty much, and it's changed, and it's just changed into something else. But the, what is for sure, when anybody here truthfully tell me they went out the group of friends and talked about what movies they've seen. Mm. They only talk about the streaming they've seen. Mm -hmm. Me too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lingua franca is no longer the latest Pedro Almodovar or Nick Rogue movie. It's, um, no, did you see whatever? Mm -hmm. And that was the group viewing and everybody can talk about it. It used to be Cinema 1, Cinema 2, Paris mm -hmm. Theatre and Coronet mm. Cinema. And... Um, you would see the films and people were queuing. I, I remember seeing my films when there were 500 people outside every performance queuing to get in. I mean, there was a world, and that wasn't so long ago. Mm -mm. And um, I would love to see it, but it's not gonna happen again. They're not gonna queue. Well, they queue for some sort of films, people, but the cinema that I presume everybody is here, because you're here to watch this, film about some producer, you must be quite interested in, in the cinema. Mm. But the cinema, is, it's, it's not the idea of storytelling, not the idea of a camera, not the idea of a text, not the mm. idea of production design and everything else. It's the individualism right. of a vision um, which is challenged, I think. So much of your work is about pushing boundaries and that counterculture and what are some of the boundaries that you think need pushing next? Or well, no, no, I'm not really just, I'm not trying to aggravate people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, no. But I'm trying to, <laughs> to I'm trying to, I think cinema 
it's good to shock people, mm -hmm. and it's good to be um, confronted by images, sound, music, and ideas in a darkened room with other strangers. You know, it's a very, very powerful thing, and it was very powerful for me when I was growing up, and it's still very powerful for me when I am energetic enough to go to the cinema, and um, you get really good payback if you see a wonderful film with a group of people. That's a, that's a memorable, always memorable. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's, it's not much of the telly or the screen which is on constantly. When it gets uncomfortable, you can go and make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or go mm -hmm. to the toilet. You don't do that in the movie house because you have to stick, you maybe close your eyes, but you have to hear it, whatever happened, to make the film good, you know. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you really have to be shocked in a film to make it good. And uh, like in a text, when you read a book, you know, it's um, not all comics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like comics, and but I am also like uh, to... Um, and the most of the filmmakers that I work with are like that. And I've, in my, um, I've worked with them because they are sort of similar, similar minded, and you sort of you you, you group together, right. and, and and do that. Yeah. So I just have a few more questions, but please feel free to think of your questions now, and I'll I'll turn to the audience in just a moment. Um, what are your hopes that audiences take away from this film, and why? Why now? Why is this film being created now? I guess that's... This documentary, you mean? This right? documentary, yeah. Even though it's a question for Mark, but... I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, you what know, was you know, his? Mark. I mean, but I suppose the producers are hidden characters. Mm -hmm. They're normally despised. They're normally fat with cigars, vulgar, in jail, in a jail cell, maybe even. <laughs> and um, they're totally unscrupulous. <laughs> and interested only in one thing, cash. You know, that is the image of a producer, and that's what you've seen in hundreds of films, but it's not true, and it's just a cliché, and uh, I'm not like that. <laughs> you can see that, and I haven't followed the money, yet I've been very successful with my films because people have gone to see them, a lot of people have gone to see them over the years, and they still go and see them now, and I restore my films, and I'm proud of my films um, no longer. I'm no longer the proprietor of my films, but that stopped, and uh, they're owned by somebody else. <clears throat> Are there any questions from the audience that we'd like to to take in? Yeah, we have a question over here. We have a microphone coming around. Here, there's a microphone coming. I was hoping I would project without it, but that's okay. <laughs> So, I, first of all, I, I just really felt through this um, documentary that I was on the journey with you, and I really loved it. And I, I also, it, 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 um, it expanded me, and it made me feel that there are a lot of films that I need to look at and look at in a different way uh, because of the things that you highlighted through that film um, and also, I was curious, like, how old are your own children now, and have they, they seen this? Yeah, they're, yeah, they've seen it, but it's boring old dad, you know. <laughs> and um, I have been residuous about not inflicting my my life on my children because it, I've seen it around, and it's not good, you know. Gotcha. And um, but they've all seen it, and my children are, gosh. A 42, my daughter, and a son of 38, and a son of 36. Yeah, and I'm Thank grandfather you. as well. Was that really Garfunkel in there? Was, Sorry? Was I really seeing Art Garfunkel? Yeah, well, in the film. No, sorry. I didn't get, I didn't understand. I yes, didn't was I actually seeing Arthur Garfunkel in that film? Just now, yeah. That wow, was Arthur, I didn't that's even Arthur react Garfunkel. That was Art Garfunkel's star wow. of the great carnal knowledge wow. and the catch-22 and bad timing <laughs> and uh, not a bad singer. <laughs> not a bad singer. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, we have them. Uh, two questions. One... 
Is it my imagination, or is there always this? Ex if there's going to be an extreme reaction to a film, is it going to be at the Cannes Film Festival? I don't hear about people walking out of the New York Film Festival or Venice, but uh, you know, there's uh, half a dozen times there's been these reactions at Cannes. Oh no, they they can go anywhere. You know, I brought the Sex Pistols film, The Great Rock and Swindle, Rock and Roll Swindle, to Toronto Film Festival, and the audience gobbing and pogoing in the screening room. The screen was wet with, with, with revolting, and the seats were absolutely ripped up, and the manager was crying, and he wow. couldn't do anything. So I've had, I've had reactions to films in other festivals. But can, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, you say what, you know, you talk, you're there to react. Mm. You're meant to react. You know, you want the reaction. I've had, Terrible reactions in Cannes. People screaming up. Extreme. Is a piece of shit. <laughs> Shouting, reverberating with 2,000 people. And the seats started going bang, 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 bang. And by the end of the film, you've got only half the people are left. That's a strong reaction, you know. Yeah, sure. And people left crash um, in droves. Shouting the screen, but that was beautiful, you know, because you'd really made a contact with people and offended people, and wow, that really, the power of cinema, strong. And can you say anything about Bertolucci? Just talk about him? I miss him a lot. I'm sure. And because he was a master, and um, I suppose he gave me my Oscar, and um, he, he, um, he was at a bit of a down moment with having made Delight of Luna and A Ridiculous Man, and I was there and young and had a big success. And I got a call from him because he'd seen Mr. Lawrence and seen I'd made a film in, the, in Asia. And I knew his, his, I knew his brother-in-law very well, Mark Peplow, the writer of The Passenger. And um, he was my friend and Bernardo called me and I said, come and have lunch near my office at Lee Ho Fook. Chinese restaurant, he arrives, funny you chose Chinese, they're Chinese. <laughs> and that was it. And in fact, I remember an, a cartoon in the Evening Stand in, in London, when there were these two old bums looking up at the Odeon Lister Square with the last emperor on it, and it says underneath, I think I'll wait for the takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> that was the age of video, that was the beginning of video. It didn't, it wasn't DVD then. Then I'll wait for the takeaway. You know, it was funny, Chinese restaurant and all that. Did we have another question up there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's relatively little in the documentary about the actual process of producing films. Um, of all the various aspects, working with scripts, hiring crews, finding financing and distributors, what are your most favorite and least favorite aspects? Well, those are my least favorite aspects. <laughs> No, no. I mean, I like, I was very involved in the daily life on a film set, the trials and the teas and toilets, and I'm not interested in the teas and toilets anymore. Is the teas in the right place? Toilets in the right place? <laughs> you, you know, I'm not, that's to somebody else to do. But at the beginning, I wanted to control everything, and now I don't enjoy that that much. I, I, I think the last film I was on the set every day was High Rise, and um, it's a bit boring, to tell you the truth. And it wasn't with Bertolucci because he needed me badly. And it became a relationship when I had to be with him all the time. And with Nick Rogue, they wanted me with all the time. He had to be with me. Whereas David Cronenberg and work with him, he wants to work alone. I mean, they're happy to be there, but he doesn't want you, you know. He doesn't need you, he doesn't ask you, talk to you. He doesn't talk to anybody. He's just in his head, like, making his film. And that's a director like that. A director like Bertolucci, he wanted me... He needed my company all the time, and he needed me to organize his life, and the lunches, and the fiesta, and the violin player, and the wine, and all the things that went into making films in those days. We used to have wine at lunch, a nice bottle of candies on the table. If we give a beer at the rap, now you go to jail. <laughs> That's how much fun making films is nowadays, you know? <laughs> really, I'm serious. If I give a, if it's boiling hot out there, and then desert, everybody's asking for a cold beer. You give somebody a cold beer, you put in jail. That's what they call fun. <laughs> oh, we have one, I think we have time for one last question over here. Yes. 
my concern is uh, about the political climate here. The United States is going on in Florida. They say you can't see certain kinds of films. The kids are being cut back. Will this affect the film industry, generally speaking? Uh, well, I, I promised myself I'd never talk about politics in America. <laughs> um, I'm, I love politics and geopolitics, and I read about it every day. And unfortunately, we live under the yoke of the American democracy, if you can call it that. And um, that's where we are, you know, I'm going to tell you. You're looking at Trump and Biden, you guys. I'm looking at hopelessness in my country. You're looking at Georgia Maloney. You're looking at them swing to the right and uh, a lot of craziness going on in the planet. I've never seen anything like it um, in my lifetime when I was born after the Second World War and I lived in a fantastic, peaceful place from 1949. But I'm a bit worried about the planet, of course. And I was recently in Armenia in Yerevan, amazing place. And you really felt the geopolitics of the world and the mess up that's happened with power. And that country, you live in Armenia, you're living under the yoke of a Russian jet going over your country every day. You're an independent country. You're between Azerbaijan, you're at war with, with Turkey where they give you genocide. You're between the Georgia, it doesn't really want you to cross the border. You're in a very bad place, you know. And, and, and you go and travel around the world and I look at it and uh, I was free to travel across countries with my British passport. I could go across Algeria, across to Mali, across the Sahara, up into the most difficult places. And I was free as a bird with my crew of 200, 200 people. No way today. You're not welcome, you can't go. The world is closed, the world's at war, the religion is absolutely at war with each other, everybody's at war and ideology is crazy, and uh, yeah, I'm um, a bit worried for my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't talk about politics here very much, it's not my country, is it? But um, you've heard what I'm like, you've seen what I'm like, I'd be voting for Bernie Sanders, wouldn't I, obviously. Will, will, so, will it have an know. effect in producing a film being afraid to say the truth the way you see it, because you're afraid they're going to come down on you, and so what will affect a producers and film uh, makers like yourself? I'm not worried because I'm 74 years old, and I, I don't give a fuck, you know. And I <laughs> do what I want. I do what I want, and I'm not frightened of any um, corporation, or um, I don't have fear of, of those above me. Yeah, I've, I'm fear coming into the country in immigration and things like that. Normal person, but. Um, um, and when I see a police car, check it out, you know. But um, we're lucky to live in a free country, let's face it. We live in a free country, walk up and down the street, say what you like, pretty much. And um, and um, we're, we complain a lot about it, but we live in relative democracy. I'm happy I was born in England or in um, a country that's democratic. And... Um, got some reasonable laws. I'm frightened about guns. I don't feel comfortable in America with the guns, you know, because when I drove from Toronto, I was very careful. I wouldn't, when you're in, in Europe, you go like that to somebody, you do that, he might get a gun in your face, you know, so yeah. I'm a little bit concerned about behavior here and I'm very cool and I keep my head down. And I have been shown guns by people over the years for parking in the wrong spot, taking somebody's parking spot, show you the gun. Wow. So I live in a country with the police that didn't carry guns, so it's quite strange for me. Mm -hmm. That side of life here, to tell you the truth. But I, would, I don't want to talk about police in my country. What can I say? You grew up here. <laughs> you got, you know, take this gun from my dead hand, you know, <laughs> and Charlton Heston, and um, I got to. I told She's you, I, I told you, to don't talk. Zip you know, it, so you ask me that. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I'm truthful, I try to be truthful. <laughs> I just have one last question for you. What's next for you? What's in the works right now? I'm going to make a film about Billy Wilder and the greatest director, our favorite director. And I want to tell everybody about the greatest person who made us happy with movies, uh, with Stephen Freer's directing and a script from Christopher Hampton. And um, 
I hope to have a film about him and Izzy Diamond. And um, I think everybody in this room will love it, that's for sure. And I'm trying to make it now, but it's a quite expensive film. And um, a lot of the people I pitched this film to don't have never even heard of Billy Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jeremy. And we'll see you once that film is released. We'll see you here for the screening of that. Well, it's called uh, Billy Wilder and Me. It's based on a book by Jonathan Coe, who's a master writer. It's a fantastic book. And it's about Billy Wilder um, <clears throat> and Izzy Diamond doing Fedora when they shouldn't have been making films at the time when Scorsese and others were starting. And it was about a story of a young girl who is, becomes the translator for them in Greece. And she watches these old guys who were very, very funny, but they really lost it. <laughs> and I hope it's not me. <laughs> this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for being here. And thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next Tuesday for our screening of Unorthodox Education.